Terry Ann. I work for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, and before I started working at the foundation, I was actually a teacher. So up until um, Christmas, I was full time completing an ICT teacher in the secondary school. Just out of um, interest for me, so I know who I'm talking to. Um, if you are a teacher, could you put your hand up so I can see? Hey. Um, and if you are a parent with um, young people who are in school, that would be interesting to know. So if you're a parent as well. So I guess you're interested to know kind of what's going on in education and what's happening. So um, I started my Raspberry Pi journey. I really wish I had a beautiful presentation to show you, but for some reason the internet didn't really work. So I can't show you my beautiful presentation. Um, but my journey of Raspberry Pi started um, in 2012 when Raspberry Pi came out and everyone said there's this amazing thing that you can use to teach computing and um, still kind of computer, you know, it's going to come out in, in February. And like everybody else, um, on the day it was launched, I tried to get one and just got put on the waiting list. And I had to wait a few months for it to arrive. When it did arrive and I got it set up and working, it was kind of a moment of, okay, it's a Linux box. I've used Linux before, now what? So um, I thought there must be some people out there who are doing really great stuff with Raspberry Pis, um, enthusiasts who have perhaps got a project using it. Um, I'm going to go along and have a look at what they've been doing, and maybe I could write a scheme of work, or I could bring, uh, use their ideas and bring it into schools to teach young people, to teach young people. So um, I went to a Raspberry Jam in London, and it was a really bizarre um, Raspberry Jam, in that, yeah, there's nothing here at the moment, it's been loading for like ever, so it's not really working as well. Um, so I went to this London Raspberry Jam. When I got there, it was for, there was about 50 um, men, and they all had their own kind of little project that they'd made out of the Raspberry Pi. So one guy put it into a big track, one guy was making a super Nintendo out of it. They were all really geeky, and yeah, I know I'm a geek, I'm in a room with geeks, that's fine, but they were extremely geeky, they were very male orientated, and they were going retro. So they all kind of got up, got up and gave their talk, like, hey, I've made this really cool thing, it does this really cool thing, isn't it great? And all the geeks like, yeah, woo, amazing. And then so the person who was running it noticed that I was one of the only women in the audience, and he said to me, um, will you get up and say something? I don't know, like, why are you here and what do you want to get out of it? So I did, I stood up and I said, you know, I'm here to try and take some of your ideas and take them into school and teach young people and enthuse young people about computing. Um, but they're all a bit retro, and it's not quite what I was looking for. And I, um, and then I said something really stupid. I said, I don't really think any of you thought about girls or women. At which point I was heckled by a man in the audience who told me that maybe I could get it to go do some shopping. <laughs> so, <laughs> not good. So I walked off with my head in my hands, sort of like, oh my god, what have I done? And then something wonderful happened. And actually, this one man was not representative of all the people that were at that jam. All the people who were there came up to me, and um, they said, we think what you're doing is wonderful. We want to help you get this into schools and how can we help you? So um, it started the ball rolling a little bit. But what else happened was someone filmed my talk and filmed the person heckling me. So this kind of went on the internet and suddenly people were outraged everywhere and sending me, you know, offers of support. And I ended up at PyCon UK, which is the big Python uh, conference in the UK um, with about 500 developers. And I went there and I was able to speak about my experience. And through that, I was then put in touch with um, Cambridge University. And some of you might know that Raspberry Pi sort of comes from Cambridge and Cambridge University. Uh, so they sent me a wonderful person called Dr. Sam Aaron. And what he does, he's a live coder of music. Right, and in a bit you're going to get an amazing presentation, not by me, by someone else, about music and, and computing. And he came to my school and he said, I've turned my Raspberry Pi into a synthesizer. It makes music and you can program it to make cool tunes. Do you think you could use this to teach kids? Yes, yes please, yes, yes, yes. So together we created a scheme of work and we created um, an application called um, Sonic Pi. And later on you're going to get a wonderful demonstration of the power of Sonic Pi. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I'm a rubbish man, so you have much better to So um, I created this teamwork, so that's how I came to the attention of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And the really wonderful thing about computing is that people say all the time, it's not creative. What? Well, it's not creative. Well, I'm gonna, we're going to prove to you that that's not true. It's one of the most creative things that you can do. They also say that only boys do it and girls aren't interested. Rubbish. Absolute nonsense. Girls love computing, it's creative. You know, girls love creating things, I love creating things. You know, I love coding, I love computing. Um, and, and this project that we did, it, it was so successful, it's now going into schools everywhere. And it's so successful that now, 
right at this point, a Raspberry Pi, we are creating a whole new website, which will be launched hopefully on the 2nd of April, although that date keeps being pushed back, it's supposed to be in February and March. So, and we're hoping 2nd of April. And that website will be full of teaching resources like Sonic Pi. That whole scheme of work will be on that website. It's completely free. You just download it, you take it to school, you can teach it. If you're a parent and you, and you think perhaps your school's not doing a very good job of teaching your child, go in and say, hey, been to the Pi website, we've got free schemes of work. Free downloads, free, they're mapped to the new computing curriculum. So great for schools. There's also a section on there if you um, want to go and learn something by yourself, if you want to know more about Python, maybe you just started with it, or maybe you want to build a really cool robot, you're not sure how to get there, then there'll be tutorials on there for you to follow by yourself if you want to. And there is also a, a section on there for people who want to run things like this, right? Jams. Jams are one of the best things that ever came out of Buffy Pi. Right, to be able to go to a community like ours, which is just so helpful to everybody and so inclusive, um, there'll be support for people who want to run workshops uh, on all different things like robotics and Sonic Pi maybe and Hybrid or anything else you want to do it on. We need people to run things like this. Mike just said it was, you know, he went to the Cambridge one, saw how cool it was, and he wanted to bring one here, and then he realised how stressful it is. Well, you know, we're going to help you out a little bit there, because <laughs> it shouldn't be that stressful, it should be fun. Right? So, um, please, if you want to speak to me afterwards, I, I am around, I can talk to you about the education mission at Raspberry Pi. But I think really what you want to see is some really cool creative stuff with music and programming. So I'm just going to hand you over to um, Robin, who's way better at all of this than I am. So, please come and see me if you want to speak to you later. Down. Yes, that'd be good. Hi, my name's Robin Newman, um, and although I'm not a teacher now, I was a teacher. Um, I used to teach up the road at Andal School, where I um, ran the computing department for more years than I care to think of, and I'm very pleased to see that my successor is here with uh, some of the pupils, and that they are getting into using Raspberry Pis, which is uh, really great. Um, I've used computers for a long time, back from the 70s really, and during that time, I've always tried to get into using some music on computers where I can do. Um, I did this with my first computer, which was a NASCAM, uh, 32K of RAM. You, you really know you're born with a Pi, you've got so much to play with there. Um, and then on through uh, BBCs and uh, onto Macs. And then the Pi, Pi came up. I've got um, four of these, well, three of these now. I've got two of the original ones, only had a small amount of memory in them. I've now got a Model B. Um, I had two Model Bs, but I plugged uh, something in the wrong way around, unfortunately, and it cried. So I've now only got one. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let's uh, look at something. Um, I'm going to talk to you about using three different programs which can be used to generate music as opposed to playing music with a keyboard using a pipe. That's a different kettle of fish, um, which you can get into, but it's a bit more techy to get that going. And the uh, three packages I'm going to look at are called Lily Pond. Um, and also Sonic Pi and Timidity. Um, of these, Timidity is already on the Pi, Sonic Pi is already on the Pi, if you've got a recent Raspbian uh, distribution, uh, you would need to install Lilypond and um, a package called Free Pats, which is really just sound sources to go with Timidity, which you could use to play MIDI files. I also, for the software that I'm using today, in, uh, put in a program called Image Magic, which is used to manipulate graphics um, <coughs> programs, um, as you will see as we go along. If you excuse me, I'll sit down, it's easier to uh, do the keyboard, and I get to stop this presentation, because we don't really want to come here to see a presentation, we came here to see uh, Raspberry Pis in action. And I've got one here on a remote desktop um, connected to my Pi. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the use of the um, music engraver program called Lilypond. And what is it? Well, you simply write Lilypond uh, files uh, as text files. That is a source file for a little tune. It's just a chromatic scale that starts off with um, a C here, C sharp, D, D sharp, all the way up to a B. You're off the side of the screen, by the way, so we can't quite off the see. OK, let me just push it, uh, pull it to the side. Back there, no? Yep. Okay. I did have two screens. I came all belt and braces, but unfortunately one of their connections doesn't work, so I had to delete mine to get the projector to work. Um, 
Right, so that's what it looks like. And uh, if you were to compile this in Little Quad, I'm not going to compile them all just to save time, but it produces some music that looks like that, a simple scale. And you can actually print that out like that on a sheet of A4, and that's very nice. But the other nice thing about um, Lily Pond is that as it compiles, there's an option, which you can see down at the bottom here, to produce a MIDI file as well as the layout of the printed music. And so you can produce a MIDI file, and if my um, audio app hasn't gone to sleep in the interim, we can play it. Not very inspiring, but you can see that that was exactly the same as the, um, as the image which uh, we, we had up uh, a minute ago. Now, um, how did I get into this? Well, I found out about Lily Pond because of, um, I was Googling for projects on the, on the Pi. I haven't got one. I said, what can I do with this? Let's see what other people are going, doing. And I Googled uh, Pi and music. And I came up with a, uh, an article by a chap called Jonathan Culp, who's a, uh, a professor of music in the United States. And he decided to build himself an alarm clock using some 12-tone music. And uh, he, had, he produced a little script, a bash script, and this is it. And um, you can see if we move down it, I'm not going to go to it in detail, but you can see that it's uh, dealing with the same chromatic scale that I was talking about a moment ago there. And um, what he did was he took this chromatic scale, he used a command in, uh, which is on the Pi called shuff, which takes one line, uh, reads in lines of a file, shuffles them into random order and writes them out to another file. And so he randomised the order of these notes, and he then went on to add some rhythms to them. And again, here we're getting some fairly serious, nasty, wet towel around the head bash scripting. This was one of the, the reasons why I was attracted to it, because I've done a little in the past, but I was very rusty on it. And it really does take a bit of uh, wet towel around the head stuff, but it's quite nice to do. Um, this rather fearsome looking bit here is going to append to the first line of four, to the second line, four double dot, the next one, 16, and so on. And then, uh, notwithstanding that, he, um, this chromatic scale, he decided to add some scrunchy chords on the end. And this horrible bit on the end is going to read in the first four lines, get, replace the spaces in those lines with, um, sorry, the, the returns between those lines with spaces, and then put them inside square brackets with a two after them, and that gives the first chord. Second one does the same thing with a four after it, and the third one with a... Um, two dot after it, which is down here. Now, if you're going green round the gills at the moment, then don't worry about it, because I don't expect you to, to look at that at the moment. But um, what is slightly more understandable is the lily pond file that that script produced, which looks like that. And this um, has a format where it, first of all, tells you the time signature you want to play in. It tells you the instrument you want the MIDI uh, to play with. And then it has the notes down here. One further command is this partial four, because it starts in an upbeat. For the, so the first bar doesn't have a full set of um, three four, which is three crotchets in it. And in musical parlance, a crotchet is a quarter note, and um, Lily Pond represents it by a duration of four. It represents, it, it's actually inverted, yeah, that stands for a quarter note. It represents a semiquaver as 16, which is a sixteenth note and it represents a minimum as two. And um, it starts off there, therefore with a, just four beats, or four measures in the, in the bar, which is an F sharp as the upbeat, and then plays the rest of the tune. And that looks like this. There it is. And you can see the F sharp there. You can see the next note is an A. The next note is a C, uh, which has got four double dots, so it's a dotted, double dotted crotchet. The next note is D with a 16 after it, so that's a semiquaver. Um, it automatically puts the bar lines in, although you can put them in yourself. And then at the end, we've got these four notes put together with a two after them, which is a minimum. And then another four with a four after it, so that's a crotchet chord. And then the, um, semi, um, the dotted minimum chord. It sounds rather horrible. Um, and I'm not quite sure that I would want this on my alarm clock. I think it would certainly wake me up. Oops. Sorry, it's, it's not refreshed properly. Now, in his um, original, uh, I, I did that and said, well, that's fine. Well, what can we do with this? And this is where um, Carrie was saying, if you want to be creative, 
how can we take this as a starting point and build on it and just explore a new programme to meet Midi uh, Lily Pond and some new ideas in music, 12-tone music. Um, I knew a little bit about it, sort of Schoenberg and all that sort of stuff, but um, what can we do with this? Well, one of the things that he put in his original script when he had the, the rhythms was a comment that said, to do, randomise the rhythms. I thought, well, that's something that's nice to do. I'll have a go at doing that. And so what I did was to start off with a spreadsheet. Uh, when I was still teaching at school, unfortunately, we had to do lots of ICT and teach using spreadsheets. Um, it was pretty, pretty horrible stuff. But at least this was a, a, a nice application, which was simply putting some information on a spreadsheet and thinking about it. And... Um, I came up with a spreadsheet that looked like this. And I set myself various constraints as to how I was going to do this. I said, we've got 12 notes in this scale. We want to have three bars of 3-4 and an upbeat to it. How many different ways can we make up the bars to do that? Well, if we have a single note in the bar, this must be a dotted minimum, which has um, a length of 12 units and is represented by two full stop in Lily Pond. If we go to two notes in the bar, we could have a minimum and a crotchet, or, um, or we could have two dotted crotchets. I'm not going through all the permutations of that, um, because we could obviously have a minimum and a crotchet, or a crotchet and a minimum, but I treated them as the same to start with. And you can see all the possible permutations up here, up to six notes, uh, and I must have been half asleep when I did this, because I thought that was it, but last week when I was preparing this, I realized, oops, you can actually have eight notes in the bar or nine notes in the bar, which would still fit this and uh, with the constraints we've got. And I have written up the, uh, the additions, uh, which are on the website I'll tell you about in a minute. So, those are all the po possible combinations, up to six notes, of ways of making up the bar. And those are the relevant lengths written in Lily Pond notation. For this, it's just, it's, as I've just explained, it's a simple correlation between the two. Then we've got another constraint. We take used one note for the quaver. We've got 11 notes left. How can we put those into three bars of three, four? Well, we can have one bar with one note in it that leaves 10. That leaves the possibilities of four and six or five and five for the second and third bar. If we start off with two notes in the first bar, we've got the possibility of three and six or of four and five in the other two bars. And with three notes, we've got the possibility of three and five or four and four. And again, you could have those bars in different orders. You didn't need to go one, four, six. You could go four, one, six, or six, four, one, or any combination of those. So you can see there's actually a, a huge, huge number of different bars that you can make up to make up this tune. So um, what I did was, having got that far, I started coding it. And rather than go through the program in its entirety, I'm going to show you um, the output of the program. I've got a verbose mode which shows you what it's doing as it goes along. And we can talk through that just to see how it works. Here it is. When the program works and starts, the first thing it does is to make up a list of this table that we've got here, this blue table. And it writes them out to a file, one line per file, just simply reading it from data in the program and writing it out to a file. I put an X at the end of each bar definition so we knew where the next one started, and that starts off with 1N1, there's our um, dotted minimum, and then 2N1, which was the minimum in the crotchet, and so on, all the way down to the end. When we get to the end, um, we then have another list, which can, is the three bar combinations, which are possible. And now we actually start to randomise all this stuff. Uh, we first of all shuffle that list by uh, using the shuff command again. And we take the first one off the top. It's having shuffled it, we've effectively chosen one at random. We then split that into three separate digits, and we shuffle those. And I'm afraid that I didn't really look at this example when I did it first of all. The first two that it does, it actually keeps the order the same. But I, I, it is actually at random, and you'll see that working later on. So we've chosen the three balls in random order. We take the first bar, which is one note. There's only one possibility for it, which is a dotted minimum, and so that's our first... Uh, duration. The second bar has four notes. Those are the possibilities which we read out of the list we've got, and we choose one of them at random, and again it's chosen the first one, and those are the notes for it. Three bars, uh, three notes in the next, uh, the third bar, sorry, has six notes. There are four possibilities, and hooray, hooray, it hasn't chosen the first one, it's chosen the third one this time, and those are the six notes. Now, 
Having got all those three bar structures at random, we now randomize the order of the notes in the bars by simply shuffling those, and then put them together to make up our entire um, rhythm section. We put a four at the beginning because I said I would always have a crotchet as the upbeat. Here's the first bar, there's no randomization there because it's a single note. The next one, which is uh, the four notes, is 16, 16, 8, 16. And if they go up a little bit, you can see that when we read it out, it was 2, 8, 16, 16. So that has been shuffled around and put on. And then the last one, which has got um, the, um, the last six notes there, those are, sorry, this other one. Uh, those there were 4, 8, dot 8, 16, 16, 16, and it's gone in as 16, 16, 4, 16, 8, 8, dot. Um, and then what we do is we take the 12 notes, which are in the list, we shuffle them, and then it's like a zipper. You sort of feed the two together, one from there, one from there, and write them out to a file, and that ends up with the randomized notes and music together. And then at this stage, I put four chords on the end, just took the first four notes, and then the next four, and the last four. And that produced the complete score, simply wrote out the stuff you need at the beginning, the time signature and so on, then the tune, and then the end section. And that produced an image that looked like this. There it is. Oops. Sorry, it's a, it's a bit sluggish to see where I put see the notes as well at the same time. That's better. There we are. There's the F sharp, the G, which is uh, G sharp, which is two uh, and point, which is a dotted minimum. Then the minimum at the beginning of the next bar, and you can see the rest as they follow through. Incidentally, the apostrophes simply signify the octave that you're in. And so the octave we're in, which is from middle C upwards, has got one uh, apostrophe after it, the next octave up will have two apostrophes after it, and so on, um, as you move um, up the way. And you can put them, uh, you, put, you put it down at the bottom as a, as, a, as a comma if you want to go down an octave. And so that sounds, um, again, I think I probably won't play that at the moment because we've heard one which is similar to that, and I want to go on from there. Having done all that work, I said, well, that's an awful lot of work to produce something that looks not far dissimilar to the first one. So how can we take that further? 12 seems to be the, uh, the name of the game. We've got this 12 tones in there. So why not do this 12 times and put them end to end? We'll dispense with the chords, which are horrible, and we'll put two rests after each one and simply run through that program 12 times, and we will end up with uh, something that looks like this but, um, so forth. come in <laughs> okay um, that's the I want here so that's showing all 12 tunes together one after the other just running through which you will see there with the two rests between them there's one final thing I did with this section, which is to use one of the features of it, which I discovered in Lillipom. So I'd never used Lillipom before I started this, and at the same time I was learning how to use Lillipom, which is a very, very powerful program. And one of the nice features of Lillipom is that you can do something like this with it. Um, here is another source Lillipom uh, file here. And this one has again got our scale with the 12 notes in it, but I've defined it inside curly braces and called it two. And that's because I want to use it twice over. The first time I want to use it is as the main tune, which I'm going to play on a MIDI instrument, which is a violin. But I want to add a second part to it, played on the flute. And I'm going to use this very uh, powerful line in Lillipond, which is inversion, F sharp, F sharp tune. And what this does is to take the basic tune and simply to mirror image it about a given note. So if we've got an F sharp there and we had an F before it, then the inverted copy would turn that F into um, a, a higher than that. An F to F sharp is a semitone, and so F sharp will become a G. And you'll see that if we look at this tune and we look at the output that that produces, which is something like this. 
There it is. You can see that we've chosen to invert it about F sharp. The reason there's two notes there is you can invert it and shift it at the same time. I've kept it at the same place. And so we've inverted it about F sharp. That note is an F, and so that's um, a semitone below F sharp. It becomes a semitone above. They've, it's actually signified it as F double sharp, which is the same as a G, if you know your, your music, and so on. And so that sounds like this. Okay, so that was the last stage I got to, and having talked to you in terms of lots of examples and some Delia Smith patterns that have uh, prepared beforehand, um, you may want to be convinced that this does actually work on a pie. So I'm going to shut down all of these as I speak, and at the same time, I'm going to move over to a terminal window, which is here, and I'm going to run a program called LP Inverted. This is just a little shell script. And what this is going to do is to generate uh, the 12 tunes with the inverted version, and then it's going to display it um, in Midori on a full screen, and at the same time play the MIDI of the music so you can hear what it sounds like. So let's start that off. Here it goes, um, and you can see that it's actually doing one, two, three, one, two, three. Each one of those is one tune. And you can see the number of notes. And you'll notice that there's two nines there. I said that last week I discovered you could have up to nine notes in a bar. And this version has actually been amended to add the extra four varieties of bars you can have. Three with eight notes and one with nine. It's now um, produced the, uh, the score. And if I move up a bit, you can see the individual tunes, which I arranged one line per tune this time, rather than a huge long a vertical list, and I also put bar lines in, which was helpful in trying to analyse what was actually happening. Now, at the moment, uh, the reason I've not, I didn't do all of these things um, for real is that if we look down here in the bottom right, if I can move that over, you can see that the poor pie is uh, maxing itself out quite violently at the moment because it's doing some pretty hefty graphical, uh, well, some pretty hefty processing. Um, it's it's making up the music. It's laying it out on a page of A4, and at the same time, it's trying to produce some MIDI. It's actually done that now. It's now cropping the top and bottom of this, because I don't want the whole page of A4. And we go up to our Midori, hopefully, where it goes, and starts to play it. And I guarantee that this is the world first performance of this because these are generated at random and there is no way this will ever get generated again except that I added to the script the ability to archive these so that if you found one you actually liked you could keep it because if you decide oh I'd like to hear that again you can't do it because so you have to be here till uh, the end of eternity I think to get, get it happening again. Now, time is running on, so um, I don't think I'm going to let that run its um, duration. I'm actually going to be rather nasty to it. I'm going to kill solidity on a separate terminal I've got in here, and also um, kill Midori. Oops, I've done that already. Right. So, that's the first example I want to tell you. Now, if you say, well, I thought I came here to listen to some music, and what I've been listening to at the moment isn't very musical. Uh, the second example I've got, hopefully, is a little more musical. And that is based on this. This is a dice game, and it uh, comes from the time of Mozart. It's actually got a KV number on it. If you know your Mozart, then you know all this music has been allocated KV numbers. This is KV516. And it's thought that he might, in fact, have been instrumental in doing this, or if not, somebody around about the same time. And it's a game that you can get which has got two packs of cards in it. They're not normal playing cards, but they are cards where each card has got a bar of music on it. Uh, one set produces waltzes, it's got bars in 3-8 time, and the other set produces what they call contradances, which are in 2-4 time. And the way you play the game is that you take a pair of dice, and you throw the dice, and it comes up with a number, there's two, uh, three and a one there. And with the game, you get a couple of tables, one for minuets, composing minuets, and one for composing contradances. 
And what these tables do is that there are 16 columns along the way corresponding to the 16 bars that will make up your minuet. And there are 11 lines down the way corresponding to the total you get when you throw two dice, two up to 12. And so having thrown the dice and got a four, I would go, if I was composing this waltz, to the first column. I'd look for four down the left-hand side, and it would tell me to get to card number 69 out of the minuet pack. And I would do that and take it and put it in there. <coughs> now, it doesn't take a great deal of thought to see that this is going to actually take you a long time to produce this, and the chances of dropping them uh, are fairly high as well. By the time you've done the minuet and the contradance, uh, it could take a good 20 minutes or so to do it. Again, in Delia Smith's uh, fashion, there's one that I did uh, previously, and that's the sort of thing you get, and this is nicely set, so you can set it on top of your piano and sit down and play it. Um, but I thought, well, this is a great thing to, to put on a pie, and so I thought, well, how will I do this? And uh, uh, I googled it and found that somebody else had uh, already done a, a Python program to produce this, but they'd obviously only had uh, access to the minuet suite, not to the contradance. And it was also a part of a larger program that could produce outputs for lily pond or for other things as well. And so I took this, um, uh, modified it slightly, put it on the pie, and wrote a second, uh, very similar program to do the contradance. And I can tell you, it was blood, sweat, and tears. You had to actually put in all the lily pond notes for each one of those 177 cards, which uh, took quite a long time. But uh, it was worth it, because now you can do that in not 20 minutes, but about uh, five seconds to produce each dance, although it takes a li little longer to um, um, compile it in lily pond. So let's just uh, move around here a little bit and change directories here. Get rid of that. And get rid of that. And come in here. And then in place. I'm clicking this in twice because it's. I'm just going to the, the it's a it's a suite of Python programs which are imported into a main calling program. The main calling program is really just dealing with parameters you feed in to say what you want to do. And I'm not going to talk about that. But just a very brief look at the Python code for the bit that actually does what I described over there. And <coughs> This has um, a routine down here, which throws some dice, but it's, uh, he wasn't content with just throwing dice. He said, well, we'll do it three ways. Well, I either do it so that you throw them and type in the score, uh, the sum, and then do it again and type in another one, which is uh, doing it in mode zero, and it's just taking an input line and then splitting it up and appending the totals onto that list. Or you can do it by generating a random number between 2 and 12, that was the, remember, the, the totals of the two dice, and appending the 16 uh, uh, answers you get into a list, or you can do it dice mode 2 by throwing a dice, throwing a dice, taking the two scores, adding them together and putting that in the list. Now, my math isn't quite that good, but I believe there is actually a statistical difference between uh, getting random numbers between 2 and 12 and two dots between 1 and 6 and adding them together in the distribution, but I'm not going to go there. Um, so that produces the random numbers you want, and then further up, we've simply got two tables. They've got rather horrible names for the, the variables here. Zullen Tuffel, which I believe is German for notes table, and I put a W on the end of the waltz one, because there was originally just one of these, and then Zullen Tuffel D for the, uh, the dance uh, set of numbers. And basically, uh, all you do is have a very little routine down at the bottom here, which goes around the loop 16 times, and it simply reads the, um, <coughs> reads the relevant element out of that table to get the bar numbers. So that's the first um, script. The second one, uh, there's two scripts, depending on whether, whether you're making the waltz or the contradance. They're very similar, although the contents are different, and uh, they're really rather boring scripts. Sorry, I wanted to open that. Oh, I, I know what I've done wrong. I've got the, uh, the cloud version there. Um, that's the one. Uh, it's really rather a boring uh, program because what it does is, first of all, to generate a huge, two huge arrays of the 177 elements in each one. Um, and 
It simply puts in the notes for the two parts, two arrays, one for the right hand, one for the left hand. And you'll see that card one has got um, an F uh, for a quaver, a D and a G. And then uh, the left hand one there. And it's very boring, it just goes all the way through that. Uh, thankfully, some of the bars have got similar patterns for the uh, left hand in different bars. So you only have to put that in once and then just say that bar's equal to that bar's equal to that bar and so on. And then at the end, it's simply, uh, rather like the, uh, the script we had before, the bash script, it's simply going to um, make up the lily pond file by appending everything. It's a huge long string, all the parts. It starts off all the stuff about the composer, just at the heading, and the time signature and things like this. In the middle, and we'll see this when it's done, it puts a comment, which uses percent in here, and it puts the uh, printout of the dice numbers that were thrown and the printout of the bar numbers that were chosen, so you can use that for checking. And then it's simply appending the whole lot together, and you end up with a lily pond uh, file which is produced. And I think the best thing to do would be to go and have a look at that in action. So we'll start up the um, terminal again. And what I did was I wrote one other little shell script here, which simply brings the whole thing together. And there it is. And this, this is just this is a recipe for producing the printed music and for playing it. It calls the Python program DiceWaltz PY. The parameters dice mode 2, remember that's the one that's simulating throwing two dice, adding the scores together, which is what we were doing there. Minus E Lily, that means it wants to output to <coughs> Lily Pond because there is another music engraver program which this can also work with, and minus O, the output file for the Lillipon file, which I call Playme. I then do the same thing, and I added an extra parameter on in the parsing program, parameter C for choice, <coughs> and it chooses uh, mode 2, which is the dance, rather than the waltz, which was there previously. So we get two files, Playme and Playme 2, for our waltz and our dance. It then... Uh, compiles them, there's the compile command, lilypond, minus f, p, and g, means I want the output in forms of a portable networks graphics file, uh, an image you can output to PostScript or to uh, various other formats as well, and then that's the file that it's operating on. I put a sync command in there, which is to get memory back, because remember I told you at the beginning I had a very early Pi, which had hardly any memory on it, and it was very hard to get this to work, because it kept on running out of memory. That's not really necessary now. And then, uh, I love this command, it's part of image magic, called convert, and it's got some lovely parameters, minus gravity north, chop 54, and minus gravity south, chop 500. That means from the north end, from the top end of the image, chop off 54 pixels, and from the bottom end, chop off 500, because I don't want uh, the whole page of A4, I just want that in the, in the middle. Does the same thing again for the second one, and then puts it on Midori, have to give it uh, the parameter for the full path for the file name, and then place it into Liberty. Again, I put the full path name in there. So let's actually do this, and we'll see it going. Um, where's my... Oh, that's good. So it does help if you have the right direction, doesn't it? Here we go. So it's now um, it's now done. So I mean, all this 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 is finished. The, the interesting bit is finished. It's now doing the compiling. It's parsing it, interpreting it, making, its, uh, making the graphic objects, making the MIDI file, um, and it's now laying it out first of all in PostScript. It then converts it to PNG, that's the output we asked for. And now it's finished the compilation of the first one, and it's cropping it, it's doing the north south uh, gravity chop, and it's now doing the second one. Yeah, I'm running too long. How long have we got? Uh, this is the last one. Uh, I've got Sonic 5. Right, okay. Second. It's just that some people are actually... Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Uh, some people are up for the Rouseway Tale and Tell at 20 past. So, obviously, you've got to decide who you want to say.
we'll go over there. <coughs> this one actually sounds like music. Here it goes. If you are about to go there, let me just give you a commercial. All of the work I'm doing today you can find on my um, WordPress, this, uh, WordPress blog, which is rbnrpi.wordpress.com. rbnrpi.wordpress.com. There's complete articles on this, on both the things I've talked about. And also, um, uh, there's a link on there to the Sonic Pi tunes, which I'll be looking at in a minute. And they're all freely downloadable, you can try them in your own system. So that's the waltz, and it goes on to play the dance. Uh, perhaps for time's sake, we'll just stop it there. Uh, I'll show you the dance, and then we'll stop it playing, and go on to the last bit. There's the dance just coming up, and we'll just kill these. Let's go on, move on to Sonic Pi. And one of the nice things about the, um, uh, the government environment in the Pi is that it's set off.